everybody, it's Aaron. Uh, we have a, another video on this whole theme of Antiochus Epiphanes. The main idea that I'm coming across to everybody is uh, it looks like a good. there's a good chance that Hanukkah is midpoint. And why? Because it's all foreshadowed with Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And I found a really great video to share with you. It's approximately 22 minutes long. Uh, I'm not really going to talk in between it, I don't think. It's just kind of like almost like a cartoon and it's kind of explaining the history of the timing of Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, you're probably not going to all absorb it in one shot. You might have to replay it a few times to absorb the culture and the timeline. Uh, this is a timeline that um, there's not too much information in our canon in terms of uh, this timeline. As this video will depict, it's going to go through the kings and the generals and the timeline of the Maccabees and what happened with uh, Antiochus the, fifth, uh, the fourth. And... Um, the basic gospel, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, most of the, the people that are watching these videos um, are saved, so I don't say this all the time, but this is the main one of the main points of the ministry is to get people saved. There's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. So enter into a relationship with him. There's salvation verses always in the description box below. If you have more questions, you can hop into Discord and ask people there too as well. But essentially, we want you to, um, we're asking you and inviting you to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, so again, the basic mid basic thoughts is Hanukkah is a fantastic candidate for uh, being mid-trip. And number two, the rapture doesn't necessarily have to kick off the trip. There could be a little bit of a space in time. And um, Daniel 9.27 seems to allude to the fact that it's the covenant that really kicks it off, not necessarily the rapture. So that's point number two. And so we can try and find our, our, our tribulation time slot, and, and, and then we can maybe figure out our rapture from there. So without further ado, this channel, this video is from Kings and Generals channel. I don't know what they believe. I think they're more historians than anything else. Um, but they put together this really great um, a project. So let's let's share that. And um, before I do that, I want to share one thing, though. I want to share one thing. If you look at uh, Daniel 8, verse 9, and just the first verse, I was really blown away. Samuel showed me this. Uh, it says, out of... One of them, Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, came forth rather small horns. So, this particular version of the Bible is interpreting that they're talking about Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes, which I thought was so cool. And this is the amplified version. Um, just food for thought. Uh, take it or leave it. That's just a very, very interesting point. Uh, all right, so let's just play. The, go ahead and play the movie. And um, okay, here we go. Every winter, Jewish communities across the globe come together in celebration of the festival of Hanukkah. The image of the menorah and its iconic eight candles shining through the dark winter night is one of the most visually recognizable aspects of traditional Jewish culture. But from where does this ancient holiday ritual stem? To answer, we must go back 2,200 years to a time when the descendants of Alexander the Great ruled in the land of Judea and tell a story of the ancient Jewish people's struggle to win liberty against the forces of the Hellenic world. By the era of classical antiquity, the independent kingdoms of Israel and Judah were in terminal decline. As a result, the history of the Jewish people soon came to be defined by the carousel of foreign empires that took turns conquering and subsequently ruling the ancestral Hebrew homeland. First came the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians, who ruled the Jews with a reasonably fair and light hand. Finally, in 332 BC, the Macedonian phalanxes of Alexander would steamroll the Achaemenid Empire out of existence, establishing classical Greek as the dominant language and culture of the Near East. It is here that the Jewish people became subjects of the Greek world. When Alexander died, his massive Macedonian empire fractured into several monarchies, ruled by his closest comrades and later their descendants. The so-called Diadochi kingdoms were constantly at war with one another, 
and the region of Judea, being situated in the borderland between the Ptolemies of Egypt and Seleucids of Syria, became a battleground where the two Macedonian dynasties jockeyed for power and influence. Despite this, life remained fairly peaceful for the Hebrews. The Hellenistic kings generally used the same light touch the Persians had, interfering very little in the region's culture, religion and internal politics. The Jewish people were ruled semi-autonomously by a high priest of the Judaic faith, who handled matters both religious and secular from the Great Temple of Jerusalem. In 198 BC, Antiochus III had finally expelled the Ptolemies out of Judea, putting the region firmly under the suzerainty of the Seleucid Empire. He lowered taxes and affirmed the Jewish people's freedom to live by their own faith and laws, and for now, Judea was content. Throughout world history, we often see subject peoples of a multi-ethnic empire willingly adopt the language and customs of said empire's rulers in an attempt to improve social mobility, so many Jewish peoples began to practice the Greek culture of their suzerains. This phenomenon, known as Hellenization, was perpetuated mainly by the upper strata of Jewish society, namely the wealthy priests, merchants and aristocrats in urban Jerusalem. The Hellenization process was expedited in 175 BC, when the culturally traditionalist high priest, Anias III, was deposed by his Philhellene brother, Joshua, better known by his Greek name, Jason. Jason would go on to wield his power as high priest to begin transforming Jerusalem into a classically Greek city by building a gymnasium and an ephebium, essentially community centers for Greek education and learning. He also sent Jewish athletes to compete in a mimicry of the Olympic Games, hosted by the king in Tyre. There he offered a sacrificial tribute to the Greek demigod Hercules, to whom the games were dedicated. Perhaps his most radical policy was to allow non-Jews in Jerusalem to set idols of their gods within the holy temple itself. The fact that the high priest was openly tolerating and even promoting the polytheistic gods was deeply disturbing to many Jews who clung to their monotheist faith. This sentiment was especially strong in the poorer rural communities of Judea, who had clung far closer to Orthodox Judaism. A strained situation was made worse in 175 BC, when one Antiochus IV Epiphanes became the Seleucid Basileus. Okay, so this is the part uh, that we really want to get into is is this this part of the of the uh, the video. So, um, listening ears on, children. <laughs> Just joking. Okay, all right, let's go. Cool. Various ancient accounts describe him as a proto-Nero or Commodus, that is to say, erratic. His sobriquet, Epiphanes, meant manifested from God, but among his people he was secretly known by a variation of the title, Epimanes, which meant madman. It was him who in the first year of his rule supported Jason's coup against Aeneas III, hoping a pro-Greek high priest would help Hellenize the Jews. However, only three years later, Antiochus decided that Jason wasn't Hellenizing Judea fast enough, so helped replace him with an even more pro-Hellenic priest, Menelaus. With that matter settled, Antiochus then marched with his armies into Egypt, aiming to double the size of his empire by seizing the Ptolemaic heartland. While the king was preoccupied, Jason seized his opportunity and returned to Jerusalem, initiating a counter-coup and expelling the deeply unpopular Menelaus. However, Antiochus's campaign was cut short when the Roman Republic intervened on behalf of the Ptolemies. Unable to match the strength of the legion, the king was forced to retreat to Syria. Already utterly humiliated by Rome, Antiochus's mood turned wrathful when he found out that his subjects in Jerusalem had rebelled. He stormed Jerusalem with his army, slaying the supporters of Jason and reinstating his puppet Menelaus as high priest. He then left Apollonius in charge of subduing the city, who accomplished his job by dismantling the walls of Jerusalem and building a fort named Acre 
on the nearby hill of Othel, so everyone could gaze upwards and see the symbol of King Antiochus's power. Rather than leaving good enough alone, Antiochus began to actively exterminate Judaism, forbidding the people of Judea from observing the Sabbath, circumcising their sons, or performing other rituals. He had the Holy Temple in Jerusalem converted into a Temple of Zeus, within which he personally spilled the blood of a pig, a deeply sacrilegious ritual to the Judaic faith. The king declared that the Jewish people should begin worshipping the Greek gods. Hellenized Jews accepted these changes, but many others did not, resolving instead to fight. It is here that the Maccabees enter our story. Our story now shifts to the small Judean town of Modin, where a local priest, Mattathias, and his five sons lived. They belonged to the relatively minor Hasmonean family, and were deeply orthodox Jews, who had remained true to every tenet of their religion, even as their countrymen became increasingly assimilated into Greek culture. Sometime in 167 BC, a Seleucid official arrived in Modin and compelled the townsfolk to offer a sacrifice to the Greek gods. Mattathias refused to make this offering, and another one of the townsfolk, a Hellenized Jew, stepped forth to do so in his place. Flying into a rage, Mattathias drew his knife and murdered his countrymen before he could perform the ritual. The priest then cut down the Seleucid official as well, and destroyed the pagan altar for good measure. Knowing they would be branded outlaws, Mattathias and his five sons fled into the nearby hills, followed by many like-minded Orthodox Jews known as the Hasidim. From there, the fight had begun. While Mattathias died sometime in 166 BC from causes unknown, he would be succeeded by his third son Judah, a dynamic young commander who through a mixture of ferocity, ruthlessness and bravery would come to be known as Maccabeus, a word deriving from the Aramaic Maccaba, the hammer. At the early stages, the rebellion was not a struggle between Jews and Greeks, but a civil conflict between pro- and anti-Hellenic Jews. The Maccabees began their movement with a terror campaign, launching lightning raids upon... And I should just clarify, just in case you um, you did not see uh, um, the other two videos, I'll try and link them at the end. But uh, Hellenic means um, they're adopting the Greek uh, culture in terms of uh, worshipping the Greek gods. So uh, it is my understanding that Hellenic Jews would be people that have kind of merged their, their beliefs with, with the Greek culture. Um, and, and that's what they're saying when, they, when they're speaking about that. And also, um, this is what we, this is like a foreshadow of, of our tribulation where in, at the midpoint they're going to be going into the wilderness. And this is kind of, this is what happened here. And so the Maccabees are revolting and they're, as you, as you'll see in a second, they're going to go uh, into the wilderness. Predominantly Jewish towns. They killed many of their own countrymen who they considered too Greek burning down their homes and destroying the pagan altars where they worshipped. Most notably, they rounded up the sons of Hellenized Jews and had them forcefully circumcised. The message was simple, Greek culture was to be purged from Judea. Before long, the Maccabees had earned the attention of the military governor Apollonius, who resolved to crush the rebels before they could sow any more chaos. In 167 BC, after gathering a local army of around 2,000 men in Samaria, Apollonius marched south to the Gophna Hills, where it was said that the elusive Judah was hiding out. Here, the Maccabees proved they were capable of more than just murdering civilians and burning altars. Knowing they were outnumbered and out-equipped, Judah deliberately lured the enemy army deep into his native territory where the hilly terrain made it impossible for the Seleucids to form up into their Macedonian phalanx. With only 600 men, the Maccabees surrounded and ambushed the Seleucid forces just outside the town of Wadi Haramea, routing them off the field. Apollonius was killed in the fighting, and Judah claimed the fallen commander's sword, wielding it as a symbol that his rebellion had been blessed by God. The Maccabees followed up their victory with another in 166 BC, 
ambushing an army of 4,000 Seleucids led by Seron at the Beth Horon mountain pass. These two victories would set the theme for much of the revolt, in which smaller, poorly armed contingents of Maccabean warriors would utilize terrain-based guerrilla warfare to consistently outwit the well-armed Seleucid armies that outnumbered them greatly. Later that year, Antiochus IV was forced to take the bulk of his armies eastwards to deal with a Parthian invasion, putting the local governor of Syria, Lysias, in charge of quashing the growing Jewish revolt with limited resources. Despite this, Lysias managed to field a significantly large army of some 10,000 professional Macedonian-trained soldiers. He put two experienced commanders, Gorgias and Nicator, in charge of this force and sent it into Judea. The Hellenes set up an entrenched camp at the town of Emmaus, while Maccabeus responded by leading around 3,000 Jewish warriors to the adjacent town of Mizpah, where they fasted and prayed to God to deliver them victory in the battle to come. In the days that followed, some of the local anti maccabean Jews informed the Seleucid commanders where Judah had set up his base. Seizing the opportunity to catch his enemy flat-footed, Gorgias rallied some 5,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry and marched for Mizpah. However, his heavily armoured Argyraspides were slow and cumbersome, and their presence was soon picked up on by Maccabean scouts. Rather than face Gorgias's force head-on, Judah decided, rather ingeniously, to abandon his camp, taking advantage of his army's speed and maneuverability to skirt around the expeditionary force and strike instead at their now more sparsely populated camp at Emmaus. Taken completely by surprise, the reserve forces in Emmaus were either slaughtered or routed, and their supplies looted or burned. After failing to find any rebels in Mizpah or the surrounding hinterlands, Gorgios returned to his camp, only to find it aflame. Seeing this, the morale of his army was crushed and they fled for the coast. Reeling from yet another decisive defeat, the high priest Menelaus in Jerusalem, with the support of Lysias, attempted to bring Judah and his cohorts to the bargaining table, offering to repeal some of the more egregious anti-Judaism laws of Antiochus. However, these negotiations failed for the Maccabees would accept nothing less than the total eradication of Hellenization in Judea. By 164 BC, Governor Lysias had taken it upon himself to assemble and lead an army of some 20,000 men in Antioch, leading them south through Idumea and the valleys east of Gaza to a town called Beth Zer, where he encamped his army in the local fortified citadel, hoping to strike at the Maccabees' southern flank. By this point, Judah Maccabeus had some 10,000 men under his command, his numbers having swelled as the reputation of his victories grew. Nevertheless, he was still outnumbered and outgunned by Lysias' army, so he stuck to tried and true tested methods to best his foe. Historical sources are vague on how the Battle of Beth Zer played out, but it seems evident that the Maccabees spent the next few months harassing the Seleucids through hit-and-run tactics, striking at foraging parties, patrols, and any platoon of Syrian Greeks unfortunate enough to be caught outside the town citadel. This was never enough to earn a decisive victory, but it was enough to keep Lysias and his army consistently on the back foot. The status quo changed in late autumn, when in the Far East, the Seleucid Epiphanes contracted disease while campaigning against the Parthians and died. The monarch's death meant that his son, the ten-year-old Antiochus V, was now Basileus of the Seleucid Empire, and there would be no small amount of courtiers willing to influence the young boy for personal gain. Suddenly, Lysias' priorities had shifted, and he was compelled to return to Antioch to secure control of the infant king in order to keep his power and influence in the royal court, which meant that the campaign in Judea was over. Due to his persistence, cunning, and some plain old luck, Judea Maccabeus was victorious once more. With his victory at Beth Zer, he was able to march his army more or less unopposed to Jerusalem, which, ironically, 
he was able to stride right into because the Seleucid governor Apollonius had destroyed its city walls a few years earlier. Following this, the Hellenized and other Seleucid loyalists retreated to Acre. Now firmly in control of the holy city, the Hammer of Judea entered the temple, destroying the altar to Zeus and the idols that had been erected during the reigns of Jason and Menelaus. His youngest brother, Jonathan Apphus, was installed as the new high priest of Judea. Among the sacred objects to be restored was the menorah, a golden candelabrum whose seven branches represented knowledge and creation. It was supposed to be kept burning every night, but its light had been extinguished during the persecutions. However, the temple had been so thoroughly pillaged that there was only enough oil to keep the candles of the menorah burning for one night. Despite this, once lit, the candles burned bright and true for eight full days. This supposed miracle of God is the cornerstone of Hanukkah, and to this day, when Jewish communities around the world light eight candles on their menorahs, they commemorate each day the light burned for Judea Maccabeus and his freedom fighters. Jerusalem may have been taken, but the war was far from over. Seeking to keep his momentum, Judea besieged Acre in early 162 BC. He expected that Lysias, still locking horns with his political rivals in Antioch, would not bother sending a force to relieve the siege. He was wrong, and in a surprise to everyone, Lysias left Antioch with an army of some 50,000 infantry, 500 cavalry, and at least 30 war elephants. Maccabeus had a respectable 20,000 warriors loyal to him, so upon hearing this news, he broke the siege of Acre and marched southwards, meeting his foe on the hills outside of the town of Beth Zachariah. Confident in his numbers, and expecting the Greeks to be wizened to his guerrilla warfare tactics by now, Judah opted to, for once, match the Seleucid army in a pitched battle. This was a dire mistake. The Jewish warriors were no match for the Macedonian phalanx in the open field, and on top of that, the war elephants were striking deep fear into the heart of Judah's troops. In an attempt to inspire bravery in his men, the younger brother of Judah, Eleazar Horan, charged right into the Seleucid front lines, diving under the lumbering legs of an approaching elephant and stabbing into its soft underbelly. The beast was slain, but its corpse fell onto Eleazar, crushing the Hasmonean warrior in one of history's more spectacular deaths. Despite this brave sacrifice, the Maccabean forces were still routed and driven off the field. Lysias was not able to savour this victory for long, for in the following year, the hammer struck back, winning a minor victory over a Seleucid army at Edessa. This was not a crushing blow to the Seleucids, but once more Lysias had to return to Antioch to deal with his rivals. He was forced to compromise with the Maccabees, repealing much of Antiochus IV's religious laws to placate his foe before retreating out of Judea. Taking advantage of this reprieve, Judah sent envoys to Rome. As they had a vested interest in keeping their Seleucid rivals weak, the Romans signed a treaty of mutual defense with the Maccabees in 161 BC, which legitimized Judah Maccabeus as a legitimate ruler of an independent Jewish state. Meanwhile, over in Antioch, the situation was growing volatile. King Demetrius I Soter rose to power following a political coup that saw the murder of boy King Antiochus V and his chief supporter Lysias. King Demetrius turned out to be more aggressive than his predecessors, and ignoring the Roman Judean treaty, he dispatched one of his top generals, Bacchides, at the head of 22,000 men to retake Judea. Bacchides managed to march right up to the gates of Jerusalem unopposed, catching Judah Maccabeus completely by surprise. He had only 3,000 men with him, and to make matters worse, most of them fled the city upon seeing how direly outnumbered they were. Left with only a thousand or so men, the Hammer of Israel opted to go out in a blaze of glory, charging out into the field outnumbered twenty to one. Despite a valiant attempt, Judah and his men were overwhelmed and cut down to a man. 
Judah's brothers, Simeon and Jonathan, continued to fight on, eventually defeating Bacchides and retaking Jerusalem in the years that followed. The brothers and their successors would continue to fight against the Seleucids for two more decades, before the declining Hellenistic Empire became mired in its own internal corruption and civil wars. In 141 BC, Judea came fully under the control of the Hasmonean dynasty, and the descendants of Judah Maccabeus and his brothers would rule it as a fully independent kingdom for a time. It is worth noting that even after this successful bid for independence, elements of the Hellenistic language and culture remained visible in Jewish society for centuries, especially after they were expelled from their homeland by the Romans after the Great Jewish Rebellion and forced to integrate as a diaspora community across a notoriously Greek-loving Roman Empire. The Maccabean Revolt has a somewhat mixed legacy. Were Judah and his followers brave freedom fighters, risking everything to preserve their culture and faith against an oppressive imperial regime? Or were they religious zealots, whose desire to force a rigidly theocratic society upon all Jewish peoples taints what could have been a noble legacy. Whatever the case, their impact on world history cannot be denied, as each year millions of people light the eight candles that cut through the winter dark, and the story of the Hammer of Judea is echoed once more. Okay, sweet. All right. So, um, that is the 22-minute video that I wanted to share. And... Um, there's a lot of information there, so uh, I think it'll be a good idea to replay it, look back at it, reference it. But this is uh, this is the transition from uh, the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the Hebrew to the Greek. Uh, Jesus arrived in the scene approximately 100 years after this, 150 years after this, right? So uh, all this culture would have influenced the New Testament culture. Um, and it was because of this... It, well, in my opinion, that um, th that's the reason why the New Testament is in Greek, and and Antiochus the uh, Fourth had a massive uh, influence in in this time, and he uh, he almost destroyed the Jewish culture. And if he had did that, it's questionable as to how um, Christianity would have looked at thereafter. So um, I'm going to try and link the two videos that relate to this in this video i just learned today how to do that so hopefully i can pick the correct videos and put it up here and it'll be linked at the end of the video but i did a video with uh joseph good there's a maybe five days ago or something like that it was really cool uh and then i did another one sharing some jonathan khan stuff and um this was more of a visual video just to give you some historical context of of uh, of the timing of all this and again again my theory my, my, my thing that I'm trying to think here is Hanukkah seems to be a fantastic option for mid-trib, and uh, the rapture can happen anytime between now and the summer. And, of course, I might actually present rapture dates like I have in the past, but I'm just trying to nail down a solid foundation first before I uh, present some more dates. So I've got this other fantastic video to sort of uh, slice and dice it's it's too long and there's some parts in the video that i don't love but it's like a two-hour video but i might just squish it around and, and and cut and copy and do stuff with it i don't know we'll see but uh eyes up jesus is coming soon go jesus go hasta lasagna don't get any on ya.